Huh. Watching Kyle's unboxing videos again? Yeah, he always finds the coolest... No way! A robot dog? Gotta ask where he got it. Or use your Samsung Galaxy S24 Ultra. Just draw a circle around the dog on your screen, and it shows you where to buy it right in the app. Oh, I just learned a new trick. And that for once, I beat Kyle to the next big thing. Circle it, find it. With the new Galaxy S24 Ultra and circle the search with Google. Get yours now at Samsung.com. Internet connection required. Results may vary based on visuals. Hey, it's Mistress Carrie, reporting for duty from MCHQ for episode 17 of the Mistress Carrie podcast. This episode of the podcast is sponsored by Jumptown Skydiving. The leaves are changing and the jumping right now is beautiful. If you have always wanted to go skydiving, if you've wanted to check it off of your bucket list, if it's something you just always dreamed of doing, now's the time. Jumptown is taking reservations for tandem skydives on Thursdays, Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays. If you head to jumptown.com, you can get all of the details. They're conveniently located 70 miles west of Boston, and with a beautiful view of the Quabbin Reservoir, you have never seen scenery like this, especially from 13,500 feet up going 120 miles an hour. That's a way to leave, Pete, people. And yes, you can get the pictures and video to prove to everybody that you did it. So grab some crazy friends of yours. Yes, they give group discounts. Yes, they give student discounts. And yes, they give military discounts. And go skydiving. And if nobody's brave enough to go with you, don't worry about it. There's plenty of people at Jumptown that are willing to get on the plane with you. This episode of the podcast is also sponsored by Latini Creative Solutions. With over 20 years of experience in design, print, and marketing, they can help you no matter what your business needs. Specializing in creative solutions that capture your voice and deliver your message. From supporting and energizing your established brand to developing your company's identity and marketing campaigns, Latini Creative Solutions provides design that is thoughtful, focused, and creatively executed. And they are right now hard at work on helping me design all of the things that are going to end up in the official Mistress Carrie online store. It's going to rock. So if you could use their help, Log on to latinicreative.com. Now, before we get going with this week's episode, I want to send a special hello out to all of the people that have picked up their Mistress Carrie backstage pass recently. Mike, Karen, David, John, and Jen, thank you guys so much. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, the Mistress Carrie backstage pass gets you included into this little club that we got going. If you're looking for more things, Mistress Carrie, this is the way to get it. You get access to exclusive blogs and posts, photos, listener polls, details on the podcast, inside information, and so much more. And very soon, it'll get you discounted merchandise in the official online Mistress Carrie store, and in the not-so-distant future, some awesome video content as well. So if you're looking to put a little more Mistress Carrie in your life, head to patreon.com slash Mistress Carrie and get yourself the Mistress Carrie backstage pass. I also want to thank everybody that's been having me do cameo videos for them. Yes, I have a cameo page. And if you are looking for a way to celebrate someone's birthday, an anniversary, a military retirement, a gender reveal that I did recently... However you need to commemorate a huge landmark experience in your life, do it with a custom Mistress Carrie cameo. Just search Mistress Carrie on the Cameo app. Okay, this episode of the podcast I am super excited about because it's one of the people that I have known the longest in radio. I tried to get him to nail down exactly how many voices he can do, and he couldn't do it. He couldn't figure out how many because the list is endless. Kevin Barbary is one of the most creative people I have ever worked with. He can mimic anyone's voice, and he can come up with an original voice for a character that you just thought of. I watched him work as part of the Hillman Morning Show on WAF for years, and I was so excited when he agreed to be on the podcast. 
He and I share a love of music and film and stage plays. And when it comes to creativity, well, it's kind of hard to compete with Kevin Barbary. There are so many things that you heard on the air at WAF that you remember, and you remember them because of the creativity of Kevin Barbary. And he does one hell of a Jeff Goldblum impression. And you know how much I love Jeff Goldblum. So here he is, the one and only Kevin Barbary. Hey, what's up? This is Sully from Godsmack. Strap on those boots, baby, because you are now in the trenches of the war room with the one and only Mistress Carrie right here on the Mistress Carrie podcast. What's up? This is Joe Rogan, and you're listening to Mistress Carrie. I have so lovely, pretty eyes. Hey, this is Brent from Shinedown, and you're listening to Mistress Carrie. Hey, Carrie, go put your brow on, girl. Hey, this is Steven Tyler, and you'll be listening to the baddest bitch in Boston, Mistress Carrie. What's up? This is Aaron from Stan. And you're listening to Mistress Carrie. Hi, everybody. This is Dave Grohl from the Foo Fighters, and you're listening to the one, the only, Mistress Carrie. Hey, this is David from the band Disturbed, and you're listening to the baddest bitch in Boston, Mistress Carrie. This is Marilyn Manson, and you're listening to the baddest bitch in Boston, Mistress Carrie. Hi, this is Flea from the Red Hot Chili Peppers, and you're listening to Mistress Carrie. This is Dennis Leary. You are listening to my favorite, Mistress Carrie. Hey, this is Corey from Stone Sour, and you're listening to. You have the privilege of listening to. Mr. Scary. Oh, God. Oh, yeah. Kevin. Carrie. Hi. It's like we're in the same room again. I know. Isn't it weird? Yeah. We both have our little home setups. We don't have to leave the house. What do we need to leave the house for? Okay, so Kevin Barbary, the first thing I have to say is you have this enviable purple light that people listening to the podcast can't see, but your whole home studio is aglow with this light that looks like my hair. Yes, I, I need did that, that just for you. I need that in my life. I need that in MCHQ. It looks so good. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it was um, made by Philips. So you, you, you buy the light bulbs, and then uh, behind me there's like a long strip. It looks like a neon thing, but it's bendable. Uh, and there's a strip going down the wall and under the desk, and everything goes through your phone, and you can tell it to to do what you want. They're all over the house, so I could tell like Siri well, to change like all the lights in the house don't, or something. Don't she would say do. her name. Don't <laughs> say it, or she'll start doing stuff. Yeah, it's great though. Like you buy one box, it's like 150 bucks or something like that that comes with the the hub and three light bulbs, and you can control up to 150 things on it. Wow. And you keep adding and I got kind of addicted to it. So it's like they're everywhere now. I need to make MCHQ look a little cooler now. I mean, I think Definitely. the studio looks cool, but now I have lighting envy. Yeah. You don't have to worry about, um, you know, people coming in, taking pictures for mass production all over the Internet right now. So you have no. time to get some lighting ready and, and do it. Isn't We're still it doing funny stuff in our pajamas. <laughs> that when we started working together at AAF, like people would come into the studio and take film photographs that they would have to get developed. And then yes. by the time that we left radio the way that we knew it, you know, people were just taking amazing high resolution photos on their phone and uploading it to the interwebs. Like it's crazy how much technology changed in the time that you and I were both at AAF. I know we, we used to have to, the fir- I remember the first thing, that we got, if I remember correctly, was we all got our own AOL addresses. Like uh, Kevin, W-A-F at AOL.com. And so he had to go on America Online, like through the old modem, like the... <laughs> to connect, to, to answer uh, listener emails. Kids will never understand the struggle. <laughs> yeah. oh, They'll just we'll... never understand that struggle. And we had one computer to go on the internet for like the whole radio station. Yeah, and it was far, far away from the studio at the time until they decided, yeah. oh, maybe we should put one closer. Uh, and then the worst was having to edit things because we had to do it on actual reel-to-reel Tape tapes. with a razor blade. With yeah. a razor blade, yeah. I still have one of those giant machines in my basement that I just sit there so I can show the kids. And, you know, kids, in my day, we had to, <laughs> we had to cut and tape things. That's how I learned how to edit audio was watching Chris Engel 
do the Friday weekend kickoff and he would have to assemble all those audio clips from the whole week of the Hillman morning show. And there for years until we moved from the Westboro studios to Boston in 2000, that was all like on tape and whatever. And just watching him during commercials, like, cause I would run the board for him in commercials while he'd be cutting with the razor and stuff would be flying. And that's how I was like, Oh my God, do I really want to do this for a living? And thank God I learned that way because it made the digital jump. It was like, oh, this is so easy. Yeah. You re- we resisted the change at first, but then we were like, oh, how about that? Yeah. And then after we edited everything on tape, we still had to record it onto another thing to bring it in the to studio. Play it. These, the carts that look like eight track tapes now, we had to record everything again before we could even bring it in to, to work in the studio sometimes. Oh, such, I know. So stressful. Imagine I, doing I just, like the stuff I did, like songs with backup singers and everything. It was, that's why I was never in the studio half the time. <laughs> it's so crazy. So I want to introduce, for anybody that is listening to the podcast that has discovered, I mean, there's there's listeners now in 86 countries. So if there's people that discovered the Mistress Carrie podcast and don't know who Kevin is, uh, just based on the intro that you just heard me give, Kevin, and how many years did we work together? I started interning at WAF in 1991. I started there in 1993 and left there in 2012. Wow. So I was there the whole time you were there, but I wasn't on the air as a DJ until 98. But we worked together. I interned for the morning show with you guys for a while. Brought in the coffee for people and every morning. Picked up your uh, guests at the airport in my car sometimes and (laughs) drove the AAF van around for years. And I I kind of, I remember at one point... um, we were doing something together, and you, were, I believe, were driving, and I had to be on a motorcycle with somebody going to Gloucester. I don't know why. Oh, but my God. Does that God. sound familiar? We were doing some kind of broadcast or some kind of stunt. It might have been related to the perfect storm. Oh, gee, Knowing I'm, I'm our sure it hokey was. Uh, things yeah. that we did. But uh, I remember us doing that together, and, of course, uh, you were at every single event that we did because you were oh, helping set up. All the ticket blitzes and, and the live broadcasts and the concerts. And I look back at the amount of hours I spent in those vehicles, in the rock bus, driving around in that van. Yep. It's just insane. They were so clunky too. Yeah. <laughs> And we, like, I loved, remember that big old black convertible, the Titanic? The whole back seat was just stereo. I used to love driving that thing. I'd get on the pike at like two in the morning and blare music and do like a hundred on the pike to bring it back to the garage. Oh, I loved that thing. I had to be in, uh, when Batman, one of the Batman movies came out, they had me in that thing dressed as Batman. Yeah. During the show. Um, I remember, yeah, that was fun. The Titanic. I have some pictures of some guests of the Titanic here and there. I've noticed. That's one of the things that I've been trying to do is slowly go. I have Rubbermaid tubs full of pictures and newspaper articles and just like, because I never thought I would ever get to the point where I needed to like archive my career and all of my time at the radio station. I, I never thought that the station would ever be gone. Yeah. I never and thought when, I wouldn't be there. I thought we were just, it was just kind of those things like you never think your mom's going to pass away. Or you yeah. know, it's just oh, like I'm you know be in the AF. back of your head that it could happen, but it was just like it was such a no. It could you just be in de- total denial over it. I mean, right. I, I always kind of had an idea that one day. I think anybody that's ever worked at AAF or anyone that's ever worked in radio in general got up every day and went into work every day and always had a little bit of it in their brain that today was the day you were going to get fired, just yeah. because. You just live this, uh, the ratings are coming out and sales is dead. You're just always made to feel like you were replaceable, right? Right. Always made to feel like you needed to do more and weren't with doing less. enough. <laughs> yes, with less. Um, but it didn't matter how much you did. You still kind of felt like that wasn't enough. And any day you were just going to walk in and it was going to be like Chris Hansen, you know, why don't you have a seat over (laughs) here? Yeah. (laughs) That that is literally what happened to me. I had two small children at the time and uh, went into our boss's office and it wasn't him. It was somebody higher up. Right. Thinking I was going in. I was going in to just sign my new contract for another five years. And uh, 
he was just said, no, they've eliminated your position. <laughs> and yeah. Uh, yeah, that was it. It was just like any other company. I mean, I was, uh, pictures were gone from the website. Everything I'd done was just like vanishing like by that afternoon. Yeah. So it was very weird. Well, for me, it was, we've eliminated your radio station. <laughs> we've eliminated the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, we just, Mike Shu and I sat there because they, they told us both at the same time. Yeah. And we just looked at each other and we were like, is this the fucking Twilight Zone? Like, what do you mean the station's sold? What do you, what do you mean WAF is gone? Like, that's 50 years of legacy. Yeah. What I was there for 29, but the station... I always viewed myself as a caretaker of it. Like I always imagined there would come a time where they'd go, okay, Carrie, it, it's not working anymore. You're too old. You can't keep up. We, you know, yeah. whatever it was. And I would hand over the caretaking job of that station to someone new. Yeah. But I always viewed me leaving AAF as handing the reins over to someone else. I never expected they'd shoot the horse. Right. And yeah, that sure, yeah. has been... I mean, you and I have had a very different, I always say it would be easier if the station were still there that I could still look at it and say I was part of that. Mm -hmm. That was your experience that you were let go, but the station went on without you. Mm -hmm. And that sucks. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 you'll, you'll, you would still be getting the same reactions that I did. It's just that there wouldn't be anything for you to go back to. Like, right. you know, once I was gone, it was, you know, nobody could really talk about it or call in about it on the air that much. So when I would run into people or people would ask me on social media or whatever, uh, they'd be like, oh, you should be on the show or this is going on on the show or y you're really missing this and we wish you were there and all that. And, and you know, I was like, well, I, I'm just sitting here. I can't really, <laughs> I can't really do anything yeah. about it. So it was, uh, yeah, it was weird. And it was, a, it was purely just a corporate money decision. I think at the time I didn't really have any advertisers that, you know, would leave if I was gone. And uh, everybody else had a lot of that behind them to help keep them on the air. At some point, the station, I don't know if you felt this, but I think at some point the station went from being more what whatever to we would have to do to please the audience. That's what we do. And right. it kind of switched over to, well, we're going to get more, more money from this advertiser, so let's do this instead of what the audience wants. And it kind of developed more and more of that as the years went along. We used to be able to do whatever we wanted and whatever the listeners wanted. And on the drop of a hat, we could leave the studio and go somewhere and do a, do a, a show. We could do an IHOP and do our, a pancake yeah. show. And it just once, you know, chipping away at it over the years to where it wasn't like that anymore. And I've I've done a lot of post mortem on the station. Obviously, I have nothing else to do for the last seven and a half months or whatever. <laughs> and trying to pinpoint it, it's like there isn't one person to blame, because on one hand, obviously, you get different management, yeah. right, that has a different view of what they want the station to do and the audience they want to try and attract. Then you've got an economy that just was totally decimated outside of our control, mm -hmm. and a recession that we had to deal with. And then you've got the ever changing technology oh, yeah. and the way that the audience was into And the same thing happened with the music industry when it went from selling physical CDs to the internet taking over and music being illegally downloaded and shared and how that decimated everything. And with radio, you all of a sudden were now competing not only with satellite, but you were competing with Pandora and Spotify and people's iPods. And all of a sudden we had all this new competition for people's attention. Mm -hmm. And all of those kind of things hit us right around the same time. It was like a perfect storm. It was, we got new management and technology and then a recession. And it was just like, the world we lived in before is just not possible anymore now. Yeah. And, and and with all of the uh, the COVID stuff going on, it, it's it, it's kind of prevented us from even doing the kind of show we could do from home because a lot of people, you know, we could have a lot of people come in. We could go somewhere and do a show. Yeah. Like you were, we were talking before we, you know, started the show about how you couldn't go backstage and do anything right now because nobody's doing anything. There's no tours. <laughs> There's no concerts. Uh, it's uh, yeah, it's very, it's very strange. Like I kind of had an inkling and worry when iPods started becoming really popular. Cause I'm like, at some point they're gonna make this how people listen to the radio. 
which is going to take people out of their cars, which is going to change when it's popular to listen, which is going to change this. But it went far beyond what I imagined. I didn't imagine we'd be walking around with our phones and everybody looking at them instead of talking to each other. And it's Nobody it's could so have weird. imagined the way that smartphones have completely changed how we function on a minute-to-minute. I mean, not, not even day to day anymore Mm -hmm. our phone has just completely changed how we interact with the world on every level how you communicate with your family how i mean you have a new baby who i just saw and (laughs) she's incredibly beautiful but you have older kids yeah the way that your phone with the resolution of camera allows you to document your baby's upbringing versus your older kids (laughs) it's with a polaroid and a Kodak Seri- Instamatic. Seriously, I mean, it's crazy. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, you know that is one that is one cool thing about what we would do moving forward and with sh- with broadcasting or interviews or everything. It took so much work and effort to do a show somewhere besides the studio. Now we could pretty much do it over our phone, no problem. Both of us are doing it in our own home studios, which twenty years ago. We would never have even been able to fathom how much money the equipment we have would have cost 20 years ago because obviously technology, as it advances, it also gets more affordable. Yeah. And being able to, I mean, I know that the video software I use just for cocktails in the war room 20 to 30 years ago is what television stations were using, and it was like a million dollars. Just to be able to switch cameras and put bugs in the screens and scrolling (laughs) information on the screens... 30 years ago, that was million dollar technology for like Channel 5. Yeah. It was and like. Now that, I have it in my war room. It was like audio. We, I, you know, I used to work at a television station before I came to AF, and, you know, we had video cassettes that were the, the size of a, a small VCR. That's how big the video cassettes were. And you had to edit them, you know, record, insert, and all that. It's, it's nuts. It's and crazy. now it's. Now you can just do it on our phone. Actually, if we were broadcast, if I was using my phone right now instead of my laptop, the quality would probably be better because my phone's oh. got like a 4k thing on it i could walk around and show you the house so next time i'm gonna yeah. go through my phone because uh a lot of setup was required for me to even have a camera for you to see me today <laughs> i know but i'm glad that you're in your home studio because yes. th- it sounds really good whereas mm-hmm. sometimes when i interview people in their homes they're like in their kitchen yeah and everything's echoey and you can hear that they're not in an, a soundproofed studio yeah Which is one of the reasons why I wanted to build a studio, you know, after I started my company and launched the podcast is that I wanted a room that I could go in that sounded really good. And Mm -hmm. who knows, maybe I'll end up back on the radio again, but maybe I'll do it from this room instead of having to sit in traffic and drive to Boston or wherever. Yeah. It's possible. If if it's, uh, you know, if it gets to the point where this is all people do, you can have a lot better guests too because you can get them to hook up from their homes and yeah and people can see them it's uh yeah well let's go back to the beginning because i want to recap especially for people that um aren't familiar with your career at waf like i it's so weird that there's this whole new podcast audience from around the world yeah that it's like obviously all of the AAFers that we brought to the mistress carrie podcast is amazing but there's this whole new audience that's like I just found you online and I love your podcast. So you have this amazing skill set that is so hard to describe, Mm. but you basically came to WAF to be a member of the morning show to do voices, impressions, production, music. Mm. I mean, so you were working in TV. Where were you? Let's go back to the beginning. Uh, Well, I... uh I was actually like beginning, like how I ended up in radio or, or how just, I ended up at AAF. How you <laughs> ended, ended up behind a microphone in the first place. Okay. I was uh, going to school to be a plastic surgeon and I won a random. contest. <laughs> so random. I won a contest on the radio and the contest was tickets to Live Aid. So everybody that won the tickets on that radio station rode on a bus together to the show. Um, while we were on the bus, I was like just entertained. I don't remember if I had a date with me or a friend or something. I think it was a girl that was just a friend of mine. I was doing like voices, made people laugh and whatever. It was people that at the time were very front, you know, like Robin Leach or Pee Wee well, Herman. Well, relevant. Live Aid was 1985. So we're talking about 1985 right now, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. So uh, 
after that day, you know, I met the morning show because the morning show guys went with us and their program director. The next day, the morning show from that station asked if I would come in and, and meet with them. And I started doing like some voices for them, which led to bits. I ended up switching from uh, what I was going to school for to a broadcasting school. You um, went already, from, from do, mm, in the boob business to being in the boob business. To being a boob. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. There you go. Yes. Uh, and uh, I went, so I'd already gone to film school. So I, I, that's what I really wanted to get into was film. But I was like, I'm never going to be able to be a f- filmmaker in Greenville, South Carolina. So I thought, well, I'll just, you know, make fake boobs for people. And so... <laughs> Much anyway, more lucrative. Yeah. I ended up in, a, in the broadcasting school and, and radio and television and journalism, and I got an associate's degree there. And then um, doing stuff on that station uh, led to me being hired by another station. I was on a rock station first. So let me get that out there. Then I got moved over to like an adult contemporary station that was huge down there. It was like number one. Their morning show was very popular. And I got a job as their head copywriter. So I started writing commercials for them, but they hired me so I could do stuff on their morning show too. So it was oh. like, we don't have a position on the morning show. We're going to hire you for this and have you doing things with us. Nobody that gets hired in radio ever gets hired for one job. Radio right? is one of those industries that you always have to be doing six things at the same time to kind of mm-hmm. justify your existence. And like we were talking about before, make it so that that fear of getting fired on a day-to-day basis was a lot less because it was like, yeah. oh, well, if I'm doing six things, it would be harder for them to replace me. Right. I'm irreplaceable. Uh, and then that 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 job on that station, the person who did the news there ended up being a general manager of another station in another town. He hired me to produce and co-host that morning show. So I went from like making nothing to making a lot like overnight, and I became like a co-host on a show. This was in Charlotte, North Carolina. And then from there, I went back to a rock station, um, WROQ, and uh, that was also from association. Someone there knew me from the other place. And from there, um, the consultant for our company was the same one that did WAF. And he said, I have a show that needs a co-host up in Boston. Would you like to go up there and meet him? And so I came up and did the show with Greg for like a week and a half, two weeks. And about a month later, I got a call that they hired me. And there you go. 1993 to 2012. Rip. It's so crazy. <laughs> it's it because my radio career, I, I started and ended at the same company at yeah. the same, or not the same company. Actually, I, I survived four companies, I think at the same station. Yeah, we were, I think when, when I came there, we were Zappos. Yep. Then, then we, we were, were American Radio Systems for a hot minute. Uh, yeah, I was thinking we were CBS for a hot minute, but it was America Radio, and then at some point, then they the merged CBS? with with Infinity. Okay, yeah, and we got sold off, and that's when Intercom got Intercom. us. Intercom, and, and then, then Intercom for me, just, yeah. Intercom merged with CBS again, and then I survived that, and then obviously the station didn't survive much after that. But I think that's I think that's where a lot of the chipping happened because as each company that took over got bigger and bigger. We got better equipment and better facilities, but the stuff we were able to do with it kind of was like, it was knocked down. So, but And plus uh, you get more lawyers involved. They're more, they're owning more and more stations around the country. And obviously the bigger your company gets, the more you have to lose in a lawsuit or, and, and then society changes on what's acceptable and what you can get away with actually on the people's airwaves. And I mean, I remember I interned for the morning show and stuff until 94, and then from 94 to 98, I was on the street team. But when I started on the air in 98, there were almost no rules, especially for me, because I was on the air at night. You guys were on in the morning where you still had to be a little bit careful because people were with the kids in the car and driving to work. Eight, nine o'clock at night on WAF. I mean, if there Forget wasn't it. people naked and doing <laughs> drugs and drinking, and if if that wasn't happening every night, you weren't doing your job. Oh yeah, I, I went in one time, uh, one night to pick something up after a concert or something, and our uh, person on the air, Rocco, rest in peace, was doing the show laying on the floor. Yeah. <laughs> With the mic over his head because he's having back trouble or something. Yeah. And he would just have somebody tell him when it was time to talk. You know, now that's a professional. Yeah. The well, show must go on. That's right. I'm going to lay on the floor and just just tell me when I need to say something. Oh. 
Yeah. Yeah. It oh, just... Those were the days. So I want to talk to you about this skill set that you have that is yes. a one in a million thing. Okay. People like me hear someone with an accent or a specific mannerism or way of talking. And if I try to replicate it, I can't. Yeah. You have this ability, like someone that hears a piece of music and is able to play it. Yeah. That learned by ear, they're piano players, violinists, guitar players that can listen to a song and then be able to play it right away. You That's can do that with, yeah, you can do that not only just with music though, but you can do it with people's voices. Yeah. When did you figure out you could do that? Oh God. I remember doing other people's voices all the way back in like first grade, second grade on the, on the playground. Uh, uh, mimicking people who sang on the air or stuff like that and making people laugh on the playground. I, I mean, I, I can't remember anybody specific, but I think when it started becoming um, famous people that like it, I started doing it at home, imitating like stuff I heard on Monty Python or stand-up comedians records or things like that. Because I grew up on a lot of that stuff. Steve Martin and Saturday Night Live and Monty Python. Those were all the things that I watched uh, growing up, and obviously like Looney Tunes and and all that, so I was fascinated with with uh, voices and seeing other people like Rich Little, who used to be a really good impressionist. He was on television all the time. Anybody that did impressions, I'm like, hmm, I could do that. <laughs> so I would do stuff my parents knew to like, you know, for attention. I would do people that they knew, and they would think it was hilarious. So, yeah, I, I can't just, remember. I- I like if I hear somebody that has a distinctive way of, you know, whether it be a certain lisp or the way that their accent is or whatever, I can point it out. I can hear it, yeah. but I can't replicate to... it. Yeah. And That's... how many voices do you think in your career that you've done? Like how many famous people going all the way back? A thousand? Five hundred? I mean. Well, now you're talking. There are, there are a lot of legit impressions. I mean, there's impressions that I do that. I can get paid to do. And then there's impressions that are just like for fun that aren't really the voices. Anybody Bill Clinton had an affair with, Paula oh. Jones, or those are all voices that I just made up to sound ridiculous. I used to call the show a lot as Miley Cyrus. And Miley Cyrus is basically Larry the Cable Guy because <laughs> nobody, <laughs> you know, is like, hey, it's Miley Cyrus. How y'all doing? Yeah, I'm just out here doing some ecstasy, getting ready to go on stage and twerk a little bit. Y'all want to come out and watch? It's going to be awesome. My dad's going to put on a fake mullet like he used to have and a cowboy hat and sing Achy Breaky Heart, and I'm going to Anna Montana the crap out of it. I never realized that she really is Larry the Cable Guy. <laughs> she and Paula totally Jones, is. Paula Jones is just this high, like, you know, hey, y'all, I touched Bill Clinton's crooked wiener. You know, it's just like... <laughs> Stupid voices, but legit voices. You know, I did a lot of singing impressions and and uh, uh, a lot of political stuff. I all, all of those I tried to sound like the people, unless it was just so out of my range that I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to make this something ridiculous, and uh, people loved it. When so. you one of the ones that I always loved, and of course back when they were small kids, they were growing up in the White House, and now one of them is the host of the Today Show, but. <laughs> But George W. Bush's daughters were yep. quite the little hellions. The twins were quite the hellions when they were growing up under the spotlight of being the first children. Oh, yeah. And and you kind of invented what their voices kind of sounded like because we didn't have access to them with social media the way that you have access to someone now. Right. And yeah, I was used doing to do as... these things with the, with the Bush twins of like these two sorority frat girls that were oh, drunk yeah. all the time. Always drunk. And I, that was a, you know, I just made them like two Emerson college girls who were going out drinking all the time. And I would do one voice. This is a complicated situation. I was doing both voices. So if I decided I was going to call in and pretend to be them very last minute, I would go in the other room and I'd be like, um, Hey, Greg, it's Jenna and Barbara Bush. Woo! Oh, my God, we're having so much fun. Oh, oh, I just spilled something on myself. Anyway, it's so awesome to be here. Or <laughs> if, uh, if it was something we planned, I would go in the other room and I would record Barbara and leave spaces for Jenna to talk. And then I'd run it through the phone and I would call and I'd just have to make sure that everything timed out. It was very complicated. So... 
Yeah, Jenna and Barbara were just two that I just said, nobody really knows what they sound like. Let's just do two, you know, crazy inebriated chicks. And One so. of the ones that I always used to make you do when I was yeah. interning and whatever, everybody knows my number one nerd crush is Jeff Goldblum. Ooh. Who uh, back in the day was on the, the Fly and then Jurassic um, Park and Independence yeah. Day, and now he's oh, like yeah. the apartments.com um, guy. Yeah, oh, well, you know, if you... Uh, if you're looking for an apartment in Boston, call to uh, apartments.com, Gary. I think uh, we might have some uh, <clears throat> some studio space <laughs> you uh, you might be interested in. Uh, you know? No, I love him so much. Yeah. I'm so excited right now. Like the day that I hear that voice and it's not Kevin Barbary, like if it's actually Jeff Goldblum calling me, I'll be like, <gasps> Yeah. You know, I have a much younger wife. I don't know if you've seen the... Uh, she's a uh, ballerina. Yeah, she's a ballerina. You should see her uh, uh, pirouette. <laughs> 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 uh, <laughs> she's plieing all over the all over the bedroom. <laughs> he's so awkward, and he's one of those people that, like, it's not just getting your voice to sound the way that his sounds, yeah. but it's getting the pauses. He mm, has a very yeah. specific way of... Ooh. <laughs> a lot of a uh, lot of affectations we call it. I mean, if it sounds like I'm, you know, mm, I, ooh, getting a massage or something, it's uh, lots of sounds like I'm very like I'm eating something very delicious, but it's just it's just my words uh, coming out. Hmm? The when way I masticate. To... <laughs> hmm? <That's, yeah. laughs> when you're trying to master a new voice, especially now with the treasure trove of access we have to, like people's social media and videos and YouTube channels and stuff. Do you go in and study that stuff to try and get the voice right? Absolutely. Even voices that I've done for years, if I get some kind of job or if there's some reason I need to do it, I will refresh my memory by watching YouTube videos of it. And if it's a voice I've never done before and they don't send me a sample, um, I will go to YouTube again, Savior YouTube, and look up that person and listen to them, or uh, I will watch somebody else do them. If I have trouble doing a voice, that's always been like a weird thing. I'll watch somebody else that imitates them, and then I'll say like, okay, that's how they're doing it. I'm going to do it better than that, but now I know how to approach it. So there's sometimes, sometimes approaching it, it has been difficult, but then nailing it once you figure out how other people do it is easy. Is it well, like being a, a caricaturist? <laughs> like, you know, when you go to the fair and you sit down and somebody over exaggerates oh. one of your features Yeah, I, when I, they draw I, you, mm -hmm. is it like oh. that? Yeah. Yes, you know, I went to the uh, fair one time and the guy uh, really over accentuated my, uh, my corn dog. And uh, <laughs> wow, he was very generous. My corn dog was well endowed, let me just say that. And had a lot of pre-mustard <laughs> on it. Hmm? Uh, yes, yeah, that's very similar to a to a caricature. But um, uh, I get a lot of work as you know, obviously as Morgan Freeman or Sam Elliott, John Hamm, Matthew McConaughey. These are all the ones that I just constantly am like having to record something as for someone. Um, but I'm still watching them just to make sure I get it right. So when when you left AAF, you got into radio at, at other stations and kind of did your own thing for a while. But now, like with the technology and everything we have, you've got this amazing home studio. So you're able to work for anybody from anywhere and not even have to leave the house now. Yeah. I mean, if, 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 if I was still doing songs or all the stuff I used to do at AAF, uh, I would just do it from here and send it to people. Um, but there's just not really, you know, except for except for podcasting and, you know, some of the satellite stations, there's really nowhere to put it unless you just do it yourself like you do. Yeah. It's, it's just weird a lot of work. having to invent a whole platform for yourself now. And um, thankfully, technology has made it a little bit easier. I mean, for me, I always came at it from a different place because like with the morning show, you guys always had producers and interns and people that were there to say hey go find me this or yeah. get this done or you'd walk in and you'd know like greg would say for example here's what we're going to be doing today right and then i could look at the list and say oh i can do something with that i can do something with that i mean you're having to do everything yourself 
You're I, your own producer. You're I was own my own co-host. producer. Yeah. The the own. I mean, the difference that I had is that I had time with the music because you guys played some music, but then after a while, the music was just not part of the morning show anymore. Right. I've always had to work by myself and be the one that was like, all right, well, I can't come up with an idea that I can't facilitate. So I couldn't have too many moving parts or I had to know that I could pull it off with my own wingspan, meaning I'm standing in the studio alone. My head's got to be by the microphone. I can't do anything that my hands can't reach. Right. And I was limited (laughs) by that. And I think a lot of people were surprised. I think everybody knew that the morning show always had this staff. And I think they always imagined that all of us always had that staff. And I was like, I never had a staff ever. So doing what I'm doing now isn't much different because I don't have a staff now. But you're still doing everything. Yeah. Even more, still, actually. You're doing I'm more. I'm still limited by my wingspan, though. That's why everything at MCHQ is within arm's reach of me, so I can make anything happen from this very seat. Yeah. When you look back at one of the things I miss about working from home and, and the isolation that COVID has kind of forced on everyone, one of the things when people say, well, what do you miss the most? <clears throat> For me, it's it's being immersed in that breakneck pace and forced <clears throat> creativity with like we need this done by the end of commercials in three minutes. Yeah. It was and, that frenzy. And I think, you know, uh, again, I hate to like sound like somebody's grandfather here, but you had all the materials you needed to come up with the show. If you had to, you had like every newspaper, every, you know, news website, we had it saved. Now we don't, you know, now we can, now we can tone it down we can go on the internet and get anything we want and come up with a show. And, uh, I uh, I agree. It was always like, oh, are people going to want to hear us talk about this? Or oh, are people going to be listening? Is what if nobody calls? What if nobody likes what I'm saying? It's always it's a but constant it was like, anxiety builder. But you're also in this room with these people, and like sometimes you'd come running in. If I was going to come on the air after the morning show, you'd go, Carrie, I need a girl voice for something. Can you <laughs> run in and cut this line for me? And that's the frenzy and the unpredictability that I miss from that kind of work environment was I just on a day-to-day basis never knew what was going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. I I'll have remember, to see if I can find one of those things you cut a line for, but I can't, you'd have to tell me one. Cause oh, God, I'm I don't sure even remember. <laughs> but, like, I remember waking up one morning, and Mike Shue had texted me, and he was like, it was like 7 in the morning, and I think I was doing afternoons at the time, so yeah. I was not awake at 7 a.m., and he texted me, and he was like, do you have any lube in your office? <laughs> no context to the text whatsoever. <laughs> And I and I texted him back and I'm like, yeah, there's a hidden key. It should I think there's a cherry flavored bottle in the third drawer down on my desk because someone had sent it or mm-hmm. a package came in or whatever. And and it was like nobody else's job does one of your coworkers text you at seven AM asking if you have lube in your office for an unknown reason. And without even asking what do you need it for, I just told him where it was because I understand that that's what we do. Right. That's the job. So weird. We need lube for something. (laughs) Okay, there it is. Like, that's the kind of stuff that I miss was just just not having any idea what the hell was going to happen on any given day or any moment. Yeah. We need you to drive to the Cape because somebody is launching an inflatable doll with tickets attached to it. Okay. (laughs) Yeah, no problem. (laughs) We'll be there. It's 20 below, you know. Oh, that's fine. (laughs) Take the bag phone. The, remember the old cell oh, phone the that they had? Phone. Yes. <laughs> oh, you know, I had to, uh, I had to tape one of those giant phones to my arm because we did a broadcast one time where I jumped out of a plane, and that was all we had at the time. So they had me with headphones and a phone duct taped to my arm, jumping out of a plane, talking. You know, obviously that didn't work. Right. Um. As a skydiver, I can tell you that doesn't work. No, nothing was coming over. Um, No. And one time when uh, Six Flags first opened their giant coaster, which at the time was a Superman coaster, they put LB and I on it, and we had our microphones trying to do the show. (laughs) But now we could do that on our phone, be able to hear everything. I know. Maybe Maybe not skydiving, but roller coaster you could. Well, no, but now skydiving, you just get somebody to jump out with you with... 
a, a camera or a GoPro on your wrist and you can document yeah. it all that way. I mean, it, well, they had the, technology we, has made it available. They had a, At the time, they did have a camera, but as you would know from being a skydiver, back then it was somebody else with a camera following you down. Right. Um, whereas now you could just put it on your own head and do it. And, yeah. And if you wear yeah. a full face helmet, you could probably sneak a microphone up there. Yeah. So even though you'd be screaming, you could probably record it. It's the wireless technology from two and a half miles above the earth going right. 120 miles an hour. That's the hurdle you got to get over. Yeah, I'm sure it would sound awesome. Yeah, you could just <laughs> drive down the highway with the phone out the window and get the wind noise. That's all you're going to hear. I mean, it was really only scary for me the first couple of seconds I stepped out of the plane because I'm like, am I really doing this? Yeah. And then after that first second, it's like, fine. You don't even feel like you're moving once you pull no, that chute windy. especially. Yeah, it's just windy. It's just windy. Do you ever see that video that Will Smith did about the skydiving? No. Where he, he, it's this whole, like, almost like a miniature TED talk that he did about how you get drunk with your buddies. They talk about going skydiving and everybody's like, yeah, whatever. And then the next day you sober up and you're like, oh, wait, everybody's still really going skydiving. And he talks about how you're afraid of the skydiving. The whole yeah. time you're on the ground, the whole yep. time you're going through it all, you're afraid when you don't need to be afraid because in that moment, there's nothing for you to be afraid of. You haven't even gotten on the plane yet, but you're afraid. Yeah, you can and still that, say no. <laughs> yeah, but then when it's time to be afraid, which is when you're in the door getting ready to get out, the fear goes away. And that's really the only time where it's justifiable to be afraid because you're actually getting ready to do it. And so he talks about this whole concept of how fear for the most part is just wasted because most of the time you're afraid when you're in a situation that doesn't require fear. Right. It's like anxiety. Anxiety is based on a lot of it is you worrying about stuff that hasn't happened or that could happen. And it actually doesn't happen. Yeah. It's, that's more like a live in the moment thing. It's, it is weird though. You are scared the whole time you're going up. And then when you consciously make the decision to step out of something that far up in the sky and just drop, is the point when you're like, well, here we go. <laughs> yeah. It's like you've already, like the switch goes off in your brain. And so like when you and I were talking about living in that constant fear is today the day that I'm going to get fired. Yeah. We, we wasted so much energy going into work and carrying that burden because it still didn't prepare me after 29 years of the day they called me in the office to tell me that I was gone. Yeah. And I think I, th I think a lot of the fun got lost because of that worry because you you just want to go in and and entertain people and talk about stuff that they want to hear and talk to people that they want to hear you talk about. But it was so much pressure and worry that you couldn't just go in and enjoy your job after a while. Uh, sometimes I mean there are plenty of times when you know if I was going in and doing voice every day I can't really hate my job. Right. But there was a lot of other stuff around it that just prevented it from being the fun it used to be. This is about the closest as you can get podcasts or satellite to doing what we used to do because you can do whatever you want pretty much yeah and that's you know a lot of people i've done a lot of podcast interviews where i've been the person being interviewed which is always really weird for me because i'm the one used to trying to steer the interview and getting the answers from the person i'm talking to uh, so uh carrie what was it like when you uh when you met bruce dickinson <laughs> yeah dickinson <coughs> yeah was he like what was he cool yeah. Remember that time <laughs> you met Bruce Dickinson? That was awesome. <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> yeah. The interviewing is weird, but we have a treasure trove of stories and things to tell, and people always want to know. Yeah. But like when people ask me now and they say, you know, what have you learned from this last seven or eight months? That's one of the life lessons if I'm trying to find the good in the situation yeah. moving forward in my life. I don't know if that was the experience for you that I'm trying to learn not to live in that fear and to just enjoy what I'm doing so much more in the moment. Yes. I, I wish I had learned that years ago, but it, it took me almost 50 years to even get to that point where I just I had to stop worrying about things. Do you think you moment. need to go through your biggest fear to learn that lesson? I think a lot of people do have to hit rock bottom. I mean, not necessarily in a drugs or alcohol way, but if you think you have everything and you're still worrying about something, but then suddenly losing it all um, and starting over, yeah, it's it's a 
it's a great thing. It, but it's, you know, the one thing that sucked about it, and <clears throat> you weren't really a part of this, because you actually didn't even know about this till I came back and talked to you when the station was leaving, is once I was gone, it was like none of those people, I never saw any of those people again. I mean, it was everybody I worked with, everybody I saw every day, five days, sometimes more, a week for all those years. I never, you know, hung out with them, never talked to them again. You know, it wasn't like we all got together and had lunch once a month and talked about the old days or anything like that. I just never heard from anybody. So it was like having that whole part of my life that I moved up here for from South Carolina was just all gone. So now all the people I knew were like former listeners or listeners that I met over the years. I mean, pretty much everybody I became friends with mostly were from the station because I moved up here with no friends and no family. So, um, And my... I was always kind of in this island unto myself because I didn't have a a, sh- a show staff. Right. So it was like the in my perception, there was always the morning show that you guys were your own entity as far as like the company was concerned and whatever. But also I always incorrectly perceived that even off the air that you guys were always this kind of club that I wasn't a part of because I had my own show. And then, you know... At the time, doing middays and then like Rocco, you brought him up earlier, and then him and Birdsey and the staff that they had. Yep. I was always the one that operated solo for, yeah. for my whole career. And so there was always a part for me that made it feel like I didn't belong anywhere. I mean, I obviously belonged at the station and had a role there, but when it came to being part of the morning show in any capacity like that, I I wasn't a part of that. I wasn't a part of the afternoon show. So I was always kind of the man without a country. So when you (laughs) told me when the station went off the air, that that isolation that you felt like I felt really bad that I wasn't more proactive and maintaining the relationship I had with you. Part of that separation for me was like, I just always felt like I was kind of on my own island because I wasn't a part. And I always assumed that the morning show, was, like that you were keeping in touch with everybody. Right. Well, and, I and, just and we never saw each other, I, really. Yeah. I mean, we had a different relationship because you were an intern on our show for so long. So I saw you all the time. And right. then as you got different, you know, positions and moved around, it became less and less and less. So it is, it is an isolation, even if there's more than one person on your show, because we just don't see people, especially in the morning. If somebody's on at night and somebody else is on in the morning, we don't see each other. Right. Unless you come it on was right very after our rare show. that we would all be in the same room at the same time because our sleep schedules were so opposite. Yeah. And, and the, the, even though we did, well, I mean, even though I did, a lot of stuff that um, c- could have been played it during any part of the day. The rest of our show and the theme of it and the people who did it, I shouldn't say the people, just one of them, he, he kind of separated himself from the rest of the staff because he just had a different way of, of doing things. I'm not sure why that is. He was very, he's very all business. And uh, I think it, it, you know, I wanted that family kind of thing. I wanted us all to be friends and, and you know, but, that's that's the southern boy in me. I just want everybody to get along and be friends well, and hang out and so being not, the only girl, that was kind of what I was always trying. I mean, before Danielle started and stuff like I was the only girl around. And so yeah. it was like and because I spent five hours in a studio alone. Yep. And we didn't have when I started the interaction capabilities with the audience, the instant feedback that we could get from Twitter, the text line. Comments on wait. Facebook. We had to <laughs> wait for them to call us, and then you had yeah. to record one call at a time and get that on the air. And so I, and for me, I was always the music soul. That was always my kind of job description was to be a representation of the format of the station, which was gear it all back towards the bands, back towards yeah. the music. Whereas the morning show on any radio station has way more leeway to stretch the boundaries of what they do. Yeah. And that's just the way that radio has always been is that the morning show could kind of do whatever they wanted. And then the rest of the station kind of was in the lane of whatever the format of the station is, whether it's a rock station or a pop station or a country station or whatever that, you know, you're, you're dictated on your content a lot of by what's music you're playing and what songs you're playing. Mm -hmm. In the morning we were, we were pushed to do 
everything local and keep it topical like stuff around here in Massachusetts, New England. And then as the years developed, they were like, steer away from that. Be more national. Be more international. Try to go viral. Be and- po- political and more entertainment and cut out the local stuff, which, you know, it's not like we were leaving Boston and being broadcast around the world. We kind of had been vague about what we were talking about. And I think that affected the listeners a lot because I think they thought it was hilarious when we talk about stuff local yeah. or they'd be really interested if like, well, somebody's store just got shut down in, you know, Saugus and we're going to go out there and talk to that person. But we didn't do that stuff anymore. Yeah. Well, I think they were grooming you guys for syndication for a long time, too. And, mm-hmm. you know, once you start working for bigger companies, like we talked about, they want to make you do six different things. And so if you've got a successful morning show in Boston, why couldn't you take that morning show and make it successful in every other station right. going around the country? If you're not it's hard talking to do about that Lowell if you're only and- <laughs> talking about Lowell. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Oh, well. But I think it's... I. I'm really happy to hear that you kind of have found that same mindset about fear. Yeah. It's like, you can tell I've spent way too much time locked in the house by myself with the coronavirus. <laughs> Cause I've been doing a lot of introspective thinking about what I want the rest of my life to be like and really taking stock in what's important because I don't have a family like you do. And I, I mean, I have Wednesday and, You know, she's great. And I have a husband, which I got recently, but it's really kind of trying to figure out if I'm going to put all of this creative energy into something, I really want it to be something that A, fulfills my soul and B, is something that's exactly how I want it to be. And it's tough to do that without using up a huge part of enjoying your life because it's a lot of work, especially you doing it by yourself. This again, this is why I haven't done it because I would be on it all the time. Yeah. And, and I think the, the hardest thing, it's like, you know, if it goes really well in whatever it is that you're doing, I'm not just talking about me and my podcast, but I'm talking about greater life risk. Yeah. If it goes really well, which you hope, then you get to take all the credit because you built it. It's your vision and you made it successful. Yep. But if you spend your entire life putting your soul into something that you truly believe in and it fails, there's no one else to blame but you. Right. And it's incredibly scary. When I think about all the businesses that are closing now, the restaurants, the small family businesses yeah. that are closing, that's the heartache I feel for them because those businesses were their whole life, passion, all their energy, and now Mm -hmm. they're closing. And it feels to me like the heartache of losing WAF, which is what I, even though I didn't own it, it wasn't my vision. It was what I poured all of my creative efforts into for 29 years. And then to watch it just literally get the switch flipped on it. That heartache is a death. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's like processing grief. It's a death. Yeah. And so now going out and doing anything on your own, and I think there's a lot of people in this economy and this in, in this environment that are taking these leaps now to try something new because they're being forced to. I mean, Amy Lee in the episode of the podcast recently talked about the parameters and the constraints that the virus has put on the entertainment industry and creativity and how you're going to operate within those confines to still get to where you want to go Mm-hmm. can almost inspire you to be more creative. I mean, you're a creative person. Do you do you feel that way? Yeah. I mean, I was really, I thought it was very cool when, when um, bands and uh, movie stars and people like that that you've never seen do anything started doing stuff from their house. I mean, I thought that was great, like seeing uh, musicians just saying, here's how you play this song, and here's how I did this for 30 years on stage, and that's stuff we never would have seen if it weren't for the virus, because I don't think it would have occurred to them, hey, I should just do, you know, I've got, I'm about to burst because I need to do something. I'm going to start doing a show from my house and connect with, you know, other people and do it live and play music and or talk about this or show people how I did this. I think that's really cool. Even if it's just somebody like you said, like, for example, I, like Will Smith just doing a video at his house where he's talking about, uh, here's how you make a pizza. You know, as, those kind of things are really cool. Look at what John Krasinski did. 
with yes, the, with the his good, good news. news. Yeah. <laughs> Very funny. And it, it turned out to be something that, A, gave him something to do, but also really showed that, that people are all going through this, whether you're an A-list celebrity or whoever, that this virus in a certain way has kind of wiped out a lot of like the class system because at the end of the day, we're all just on TikTok right now. <laughs> it doesn't matter yes. how much money you have. It doesn't matter where you live and how big the mansion is. At the end of the day, we're all just on Twitter trying to figure out how we feel in 140 characters to get out there because it's leveled the playing field for everybody. Yeah. That's been really interesting to see who's using it in a creative way and who just doesn't want to deal with it. It's um yeah it affected me in a in a business way only because I mean my my main income's from doing voiceovers from home and stuff like that but I had just started an events company right before this all happened and we were going to be traveling to all these different places my partner is in the music business so it was going to involve concerts and doing some you know like like a vinyl convention where people could buy records or or an oddities and antiques and uh, I took over a horror convention that I've been doing for like 15, 16 years. So all of those things got canceled like out of the blue and we don't even know when we could do, if we can do and how we can do any of those shows because of this um, current situation. And uh, a lot of my work would involve celebrities and I, f and I feel like there's a lot of celebrities that you can see in their videos or their postings that their level of anxiety about ever leaving the house again is very high. So I think getting a lot of people to even come to these kind of conventions as guests would be very difficult on the other side that we could have gotten before. We couldn't do one now, even if they had spacing. How are you going to pay to take a picture with someone that you wanted to meet and not be able to stand next to them and not be able to see their face? There's no yeah. way. You, you don't want to do it with a plexiglass between you. That's, you know, that's like photo bombing. So yeah. I, I don't even know. I don't even know how it's going to move forward with with that, but I hope it's sooner than later. Obviously, I think till the end of the year, nothing is going to happen. So uh, we're talking 2021 before we start getting into the let's all go to a show kind of thing. I had I've had I had tickets for three or four shows at the up till the end of the year that all got canceled, like a huge one, and then one that got rescheduled all the way to next fall. So yeah, you would have enjoyed one of them actually. I was going to a 35th. The 35th, if you can believe that, oh, anniversary God. of Pee-wee's Big Adventure. <gasps> and and Pee-wee Herman was coming to town, and he was going to introduce the movie, and then after the movie, do a QA. and a And it was a big deal, you know, and we were going to get to meet him, and they, they were going to give us all this stuff. And first it got postponed, and, and then the whole thing just got canceled. And it's not going to happen. Talk about a guy that got totally fucked by timing, right? He <laughs> lost his whole career for years because of you know, five seconds in a porn theater or whatever. Right. Meanwhile, Kim Kardashian owes a billion dollar empire to a porn 20 Pretty years much. later. Yeah. Now you can see what he did in the movie theater on the internet for free. Yeah. <laughs> it's just unbelievable how much he lost in a career because when Pee Wee Herman was at the height of his game, he mm -hmm. was the biggest star in the world. Yeah. And, and, I, 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 and he kept saying he was going to come back and kept saying it was going to be a comeback. And he'd do little things here and there, but nothing is him. And then he comes back and does this movie and he does a tour and then all this other stuff. And uh, yeah, that sucks. Like all those years, probably at least 10 to 15 years before he even did anything again. But I doubt he'd ever get a kid's show again. That's the problem. Yeah, well. My yeah. kids don't know. None of my yeah. kids know about any of that. That's so long ago. Well, you and I are huge Halloween fans because mm -hmm. we just love this whole kind of season and all of the years that AAF used to do Halloween parties and stuff you and I I think out of the whole staff <sighs> used to take the most pride in costumes and getting all dressed up and um, there are just certain people that are Halloween people I think you and I are the Halloween people oh yeah well, I used to come in and look at all the stuff and you would come in with new stuff that you'd put in your office or on your desk and now we get to take a look at it. Oh, where'd you get that from? <laughs> it's really funny that like, I don't understand people that don't love Halloween. I just don't get them. I don't either. It's I, it's so much, I mean, it's it's different than Christmas because there are people who are crazy about Christmas, but to me it's it's different than Christmas because you've got a lot more range of things you can do. 
<laughs> and there's, it's not tied to commercialism. I mean, it is more now than it was before, but you're not tied to like family pressures, gift giving, yeah. you know, it's not tied to a lot of um, the family traditions of like the cooking and all of those things that are, are part of the Thanksgiving Christmas season. Halloween's just all about being ridiculous and fun. Yeah. Which I don't know how I it's going to happen it. this year. I mean, we're going to have to, what, trebuchet candy into the people's bags? Or we do one of those T-shirt guns and put bags of candy yeah. and shoot them at the kids? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know. That's going to that's gonna suck, especially for little kids. My yeah. my daughter was born a month early. She was supposed to be born April 11th. She was born March 11th. And the next day is when all the lockdowns started. So since she's been born, everybody's been wearing masks everywhere. Yeah, so she, I mean, her whole life, she just doesn't, like, that's she what she thinks know. is normal. Yeah, and if she meets somebody, she loves people, but when she first meets them, she gets scared until they show her, her their face. Well, who like, wouldn't? Oh. Yeah. It's scary as an adult. Poor animals, too. Some freaking animals must be freaking out because... A lot of animals hate even a paper bag sitting next to them. <laughs> I know. I can uh, tell you Wednesday is so happy that I've been spending so much time at home. Oh, I bet. Because I was just always gone all the time. And, you know, I, obviously, you know, Grammy would watch her or whatever. But now it's like I'm so present for mm -hmm. her that I think if I ever stopped working from my own studio on my own time, she'd be like, what the fuck, mom? Like, you used to be at my beck and call, like. Basically, yep. I'm just a provider for the dog now. That's what my life is boiled down to. I go out and get the mail on my dog pees on me. He's excited to see me. I can't <laughs> imagine having to go back to work uh, all day again. She's in here right now, like laying on the couch behind me, taking a nap because she didn't, we want to make sure I wasn't leaving. I don't want to let the, the I don't want to let Wednesday in MCHQ because it's soundproofed and the door is closed. And if she farts. It totally kills this whole <laughs> room. There's nothing worse than a dog fart in a room that you can't get out of. Oof. I would just be sitting here marinating in pug fart right now if I let her in here while I was talking to you. Plus, you'd oh. hear her with all of the snorting and the snot flying because she's a pug. It would just be... Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oof. Um, there are also people like I love Halloween, but I am not the horror movie aficionado that you like you Spencer Charnas from Ice Nine Kills, Corey Taylor from Slipknot. It's been You're just good a, friends. <laughs> yeah. Like what a great guy he is. Right. Yeah. That. Um, but there are certain people that have taken their love of horror and the movies and the history and all of that to a whole other level. And you're one of those people and you're also like Spencer and I talked about you know the 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 things from the movies the artifacts the props, oh, like the props in the yeah. yeah yeah I love making stuff too I'm right I mean I I, love, I made costumes for my kids I've made the ones that I used to dress up in when I would go to the AAF Halloween party and um so yeah I love like trying to make a replica of some of the props if sometime when you're doing a stream we'll walk around the house and I can show you some some pretty cool stuff. But right now I'm making a, an alien, like from Alien, the Xenomorph costume. Oh, wait, really? Yeah, because I always wanted one as a kid, and now I'm like growing up, and I'm like, I can do this. Wait, and, the uh, big, huge one or the one coming oh, out yeah. of the stomach? The banana head <gasps> one. Yeah, the one coming out of the stomach is actually already in the house. He's like a, <laughs> hanging out on a shelf. That's like my number one movie. I have like a whole uh, shelf uh, where you would usually put photos of the family that is just alien stuff. Because I love Alien. So. so out of all of the horror movies, of all of the decades and different genres, you know, slasher and kind of all of that kind of stuff, Alien is your go-to? I would say Alien just because of the, um, it's, a, it's, it's science fiction, but it's also horror. It's well acted for a movie that's got like crazy, like graphic violence in it. And it also looks unbelievable at the time. The scale of the movie looks just amazing, and it holds up to this day even as a scary film. Uh, but it, as far as a straightforward horror film, it would probably be either The Exorcist or Dawn of the Dead. Those are both big favorites of mine as well. But yeah, Alien is my go-to if somebody asks right off the top of my head. Cause of my well, and it's right. groundbreaking for, for me because it showed that a woman could carry a blockbuster movie. There you go. 
and carry I mean, a few of them after that. <laughs> yeah, and it that is one of the first instances, not like a Gone with the Wind or a, um, you know, I'm trying to think of like famous female leading roles, but for that genre, it people didn't think that women could be the star of an action film or yeah. a horror film. And then you look at something like, Linda Hamilton and Terminator or whatever, those roles just were not all that common then. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I she mean, Sigourney Weaver just way. changed the game. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a good movie. And all of his movies, uh, I, I think, are, are groundbreaking. Ridley Scott, the director, he's probably, I, he might even be my favorite director. He has a new show on HBO Max right now called Raised by Wolves that's, that's uh, it's excellent. It's about two androids who are trying to raise children after Earth is kind of fallen in a war that's uh it's really good what other movies is he directed that i mean if you say he's your he, he's your favorite director what what other movies are um, really i mean i know he's got like a thousand yeah blade runner would be uh uh the next one i'd put up on the list i'm trying to think of what else thelma louise he did thelma louise uh another groundbreaking movie for women because it was two it was both of the leads being female right and it was kind of a shoot 'em up movie that nobody ever would have expected that to have been as successful as it was. They thought that there wasn't an audience for that. Yeah. You know, my, my wife and I ran into, not once, but twice, Susan Sarandon recently. Because she, uh, she lives uh, not far from Northampton, Massachusetts. And her mother uh, lives there and her brother owns a restaurant there. So we ran into her once in the street and I wanted to go, before I went up and said something to her, nobody believed it was her. And I said, that's Susan's friend. And they're like, no, nah, she's somebody looks like her. No, 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 that's her. It's like, no, Susan's friend's like tall and blah, blah, blah. I was like, no. We're meeting her in person, first of all. She's probably like 75 now. <laughs> and I'm telling you, that's her. So I said, if that's her, if we go in the next store, I'll go up and tell her I love her. And so we went in the next store and she was in there. And we were like, I'm like creeping around. Like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, was like she wearing shop. a mask? This was recently? No, no, it was before Corona. My oh, wife was okay. still pregnant with her baby. Oh, okay. She, uh, she was with another woman and um, this woman, I'm literally standing next to her. And I'm like, this is her. I was just waiting to hear her voice. Because I knew if I heard her voice, it was going to go. You're being so creepy right now. I know. You're so being weird. the total creeper, dude. But see, I had the I had the, I had the pregnant woman with me. so they. Oh, yeah, you, know. you were fine then. Yeah, you're fine. Plus, she's super famous, and she's yeah. an Oscar winner. I'm sure she knows people are watching her all the time. All the time. So this woman she was with on the other side of the store said, hey, Susan, look at the baby boots over here. And I'm like, oh, my God. And then I heard her say something, and I was like, it's Susan. So I went up and put my arm on her shoulder, <laughs> and I said, I just want you to know you're still beautiful. And I love you. <laughs> and she turned around and said, oh my God, you scared me, but that was so sweet. <laughs> and she's like, do you You're guys so live lucky to here? get shot. Because yeah. that could totally have gone a, the bad way. Uh, yeah, she, 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 she uh, took a picture with my wife. And then, um, first of all, before I went over and talked to her, I was, I was getting overwhelmed because I was saying to my wife, I'm like, if that's her, we're about to meet somebody that is one step away from David Bowie and Tim Curry. I mean, I was thinking of all the people that she's... Yeah, well, you know. Rocky Horror is, you know, for you and I being a, the Halloween buffs and all, Rocky Horror is up in this whole other film level. It's a yeah. cult classic. And she was she was so nice and so, like, accommodating. And, and, I, and I did tell her, I said, listen, I didn't want to bother you. Blah, blah, blah. And... Uh, Turned out a couple of weeks later, a friend of mine who owned a bar in town was having a rally for uh, Bernie Sanders. And I went down to say hi to him, not to Bernie Sanders, but to, to my friend. And Susan Sarandon came down. There. This is in Worcester. Susan oh came down God. there to, to do a speech at like 10 o'clock at night um, for Bernie. And uh, I saw her again. I was like, are you following me? <laughs> she's like i need a restraining order against this creepy guy well she rem she said did your wife have the baby yet <gasps> no way and i'm like oh my gosh no she's uh she's any day now she's gonna have it and so again that was before the virus and there was someone there um who had a folder with pictures of her and like everything you could think of and he was having her sign him after the speech and he gave me a picture of her I wish I had a better one because my kids are going to see it, but it's it's a picture of her in her bra and underwear in Rocky Horror, <laughs> and she signed it for me. 
<laughs> so that was really cool. Uh, How did underrated, we get on to <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. That's oh, what happens Louise. with this podcast. It just, oh yeah. Yeah. So, so we were talking about Ridley Scott movies. Yeah. And I couldn't think of uh, The Martian. Oh yeah. Um, Blade Runner, uh, Robin Hood, Gladiator. Yep. Um, Kingdom of Heaven. Lots yeah, of I mean, these are massive, huge scale blockbuster films. Yeah. So uh, yeah. underrated uh, Tim Curry performance in oh one of in one of my favorite movies of all time, and it will give you a chance to do an impression. I love the movie Oscar. Oh, the Sylvester Stallone movie! Yes. Oh, that is such a funny movie. It I'm is. so glad. Very underrated. I knew that you were going to know that movie because most people don't, and it's based on a stage play. And I have never been able to find a playhouse that has done the play. Because I want to see how it's done as a play. Basically, for anybody that doesn't know what I'm talking about, and you can be Googling the film Oscar, it did terribly in the theaters. Yep. But it's basically about a gangster during Prohibition named Snaps Prevalone <laughs> in Chicago. Uh, Sylvester Stallone. Who is played by Sylvester Stallone. <laughs> and it's all about the dying wish of his father, who was Kirk Douglas in the film. <laughs> He's always the dying father. Yeah, that that his son goes straight, that he that he get out of being a mobster and that he become a legitimate businessman. And the movie is about Snaps Prevalone trying to be a legitimate businessman, but most of the movie takes place in his giant Chicago mansion and I yep. guess if they do this as a stage play, the entire play happens in like a dollhouse where it's the whole house just with the front cut off. So you can see what's happening oh, in multiple rooms so cool. at the same time. But the cast is Tim Curry, Sylvester yep. Stallone, Marissa Tomei, Harry Shearer, Kirk Douglas, it's Chaz got every gangster, every, Yep, Chaz Palminteri, yep. It's this um, amazing film that nobody saw and i watch probably at least three to four times a year i love it see i'm gonna have to i'm gonna have to whip that movie out and watch it and let my wife see it too i think i even know this is really nerdy first of Be all nerdy. when you i have the soundtrack i think shut up yeah <laughs> i was a big soundtrack person so i remember that movie had really good like uh 1920 sounding music yeah. and, and uh when you mentioned oscar which blows my mind my first thought was, I was going to say to you, when I saw this movie, I thought it would make a great play. So you telling me that it was a, actually a play. It's based on the stage play. How can nobody have done that already? I don't know, I but will you huge. make me this promise on the podcast <laughs> that if you or I ever find a playhouse that is doing the stage version of it, that you and I will that go? We will go see it, yes. Because <laughs> it's one of those movies, and I hope that people listening to the podcast will go back in this Netflix and chill time we're all spending with COVID and go watch this movie. My sister's one of these nerds about this movie too, and I can call her at any Anytime, day or night, and go. You want it good or you want it fast? And she'll go, "Atza Fanucci," <laughs> because her and I love the movie so much. Yeah, and it's not a movie that's dated either because it takes place during In Prohibition, the 20s. Yeah. and it was done well to begin with. It's yes. like, I'm, and I'm, I'm guessing that was probably one of Stallone's pet projects, and maybe that's why it didn't do well. Like he was like, it I was a make comedy. Like Sylvester Stallone's yep. not a comedy guy, and it no. didn't do well. But he got so many high-ranking, like, A-list celebrities in this. I mean, these are mm -hmm. big, huge names. Yeah. And it's well, so good. Oh, I knew you were going to love that movie. Yeah, I knew it. How about that? I feel like we may have mentioned that to each other years ago, and I don't even know how that would have come up. I think we just probably were talking about movies, yeah. and it just popped up into the uh, thing. Well, that's one of those discussions when I was talking about what I miss most about that work environment is that – Sometimes we would get these amazing creative ideas because of those random conversations that we were yep. having in between shows or whatever. <laughs> They'd be like, oh, you know, it'd be really funny. And then like you were famous for like somebody saying something and then you putting like your hand up or whatever and then running out of the room. And it was like, oh, OK, Kevin just got an idea. Yeah. And, and so do... much creativity came out of an unplanned kind of brainstorming session that way. Yeah. Yeah. We didn't. We we probably should have. But. I mean, we really didn't sit around and talk about, okay, what are we doing on the show tomorrow? What are we doing the rest of the week? Um, Greg really was the anchor and the puzzle piece person who's, 
he created the framework. And then as we came in, he uh, would collaborate. Um, that's one of the things I miss is Greg is the only person I've ever worked with who was really good to write with. Um, and he could whip out a script and do the show at the same time and hand it to me, or I could write a script and he would add something to it and it always worked really well. So even though he's very serious on the air, but kind of, you know, semi-serious when he would make jokes or thing, he had the comic timing and the ideas, and I'm not sure why he wanted someone else to execute them, but he was just as good, he was as good at writing comedy as I was good at writing bad puns. <laughs> For the comedy, let's <laughs> which put it you that way. excelled at yeah. bad puns, it was like, oh, Kevin will come up with thirty right off the top of his. Oh head. yeah, it's like it's like when they do you know movies that have porn titles that are based on real titles. That was me with everything. So you know, right down to the names of the actors in the fake movie commercials I would do. It was you all should those. be writing the headlines for uh, the New York Post. <laughs> that should be your job. Oh, uh, that's fun. Do people still the, buy the New York Post? Is I don't it still know. a thing? I Is follow it, it on paper? Twitter. Yeah, I follow it on Twitter, but. One of the things I want to talk to you about before I let you go, because it's been that season and and next year is the 20th anniversary, when people have asked me about my years at WAF and, and I think anybody that lived through it remembers where they were. And so when anybody ever asked me, well, where were you on 9-11? Obviously, I was in the WAF studio. Yep. And we all went through that collective experience together. Yeah. And it took a long time, um, if you remember at the time, I think we talked about this, one of the last times I came into the station, um, that uh, at the time, the information we were getting would not be like it is now. We have so no. much more access. So at the time, a lot of the stuff would come out and it would be redacted or it would be wrong. Like we would get a story that say, oh, you know, we think the pilot fell asleep, a small plane is at the World Trade Center, and then we find out, oh, no, it was a passenger jet. In the amount of time it took that second plane to hit, so much information came through, but it wasn't like anybody was treating it as a huge terrorist attack or everything needed to be locked down. They just thought, the planes oh. planes that hit the World Trade Center before, and they were always small planes yeah. where they had some kind of an air traffic control malfunction or something and it was a heart not... attack pilot has a heart yes. attack but on our end we couldn't really tell from the hole what it was except a plane so the news people were getting information even further down than us and were telling us that you know a small plane is it and we think the pilot may have fallen asleep we don't have much information and then it started coming in you know when we were getting messages about the casualties the casualties were extremely high without having information. They were and, just doing uh, the math on how many people fit in the building. Right. On a normal, a normal average day. It was like, okay, well, we know that 50,000 people work in that building on any given day, plus all of the people in the observation decks and in the restaurants. So the casualties have got to be in the tens of Huge. thousands because it yeah. made sense. We, people didn't take the factor in that the buildings didn't collapse for like 45 minutes after they were hit and that people in in by the thousands were able to successfully evacuate even though obviously we know that thousands died. Yeah. And it our first thought so was much worse. Because of the, you know, because of the misinformation we were kind of getting in the beginning, we didn't even think about the fact that that plane went into a building full of people. So that wasn't something they were saying on the news at first. It was just a small plane hit. So we kind of didn't take it, you know, being a morning show. We we said something on the air about it, but it was more like apparently a, a small plane has hit the World Trade Center. And Greg, you know, Greg asked me because I had seen it on the television. I said, yeah, I don't know if the pilot fell asleep or something. And I think we made we made like some at the time we made like a light of it, not knowing what it was like, was it? Ted Kennedy that fell asleep or whatever, you know, those kind of things. Yeah. And then within 15, as soon as that second plane hit, it was a total different story. I mean, every everything, nobody could leave anywhere except those buildings that were being hit. And well, we, didn't know, I, we didn't know what was going to happen the rest of the day. We thought it was going to happen everywhere. So, Well, I mean, that was, when I talk to people about younger people that don't, remember it or especially because we were so plugged in being in a studio compared to the average person that was just at home in front of a TV. We had news wires and we had a news station down the hall and mm -hmm. had all this stuff. I, I try to explain, especially to younger people, the limitations of the technology at the time. This yeah. was 19 years ago. Yep. So we didn't have iPhones. We didn't have Twitter. 
there was very few eyewitness accounts at the time. For me, mm-hmm. I used to drive, to, I was doing middays, I used to drive to work every morning listening to the morning show, to you guys, because I knew that it would at least give me the basics on what was what were the big stories of the day. So when I got into the radio station, I knew where to go to focus my show prep on and whatever. And so I, my perspective of it was hearing you guys talk about the first plane. Yeah. And then watching the people around me in the world, the closer I got to the studio, as the news started to break about the second plane, I, like at first the world looked normal. And then as I got closer and closer to the station, you could see like road construction sites stopped and all the construction workers huddled around the police cruisers that were there because they were listening to the radio. And mm-hmm. by the time I got to the radio station, the world outside my car window was very different. And then I got inside and got up to the studio and was talking to you guys. And we all watched the first tower come down. And so I just remember that ride to work that day because it, it started as just a normal Tuesday. And by the time I pulled into the parking lot, you could tell it wasn't the same. And by the time I got to the studio, I mean, the whole world was different. We all yeah. knew it was different. And that was one of the only days that I remember being at WAF where it was like, okay, we're not doing things normally anymore. Right. Like I remember Julie coming in, our general manager at the time, and Ron coming in and going, okay, was it Ron? It was Ron, right? Yeah, Ron. I, ye, I think so. Yeah. Telling us to stay on the air as long stay as possible. Stay on the air, no yeah. music, no commercials, pull everything. And we're all looking at each other like, wow, okay. And and again, nobody knew how many planes had been hijacked. Nobody yeah. knew what was going on. It was just us speculating and going over everything that had happened until we got the information. I remember being like kind of afraid to drive home because we yeah. didn't know if there was going to be a plane dropping in the middle of Boston or if there were people walking around the city that had this big elaborate plan all connected to it because they kept giving us information in the news that heightened it. You know what changed my memory of that day recently speaking of stage plays? Have you seen Come From Away? No. Oh my God, Kevin, you you would love it. It's the musical, which sounds completely crazy, the musical about <laughs> 9-11. It was written by Canadian playwrights and it's it's the story of the people of Gander, Newfoundland, which was that little town in Newfoundland where all the transatlantic flights that were headed to America were forced to land because they weren't allowed to land in the United States. Mm-hmm. So this little town that had this airstrip that was built when transatlantic flight had first started because it's the easternmost point of North America. And then there was another airport on the westernmost point of Europe because that was the stretch they could make with the fuel of the aircrafts at the time. So as aircrafts got became more fuel efficient, these airstrips weren't really used for anything, but it could land jumbo jets. So overnight, this village of like 5,000 people in Gander, Newfoundland, had their population doubled by international travel or travelers that had been grounded by all of these international flights that were over the Atlantic when 9-11 happened and they had to land somewhere. And they were all stuck there for like five days. Oh. And I'm telling you, Kevin, this you have to go and watch this. It, how it changed for me, and it's actually part of the 9-11 Museum, is there is a whole section of the 9-11 Museum dedicated to the people of Gander, Newfoundland. Uh-huh. And it changed that 99% of that day is horrific. But now for me, there's that 1% of knowing the amazing things the people of Gander did to help strangers on the worst day of the rest of our lives. Mm-hmm. And, and this was I, where you found out about all this by seeing the I saw them. I saw the musical. So originally, I think there's a documentary about it. I and do recognize the name. Yeah. I, mm-hmm. If you go and look, you can find the documentary that's mm-hmm. online. They did a screening of it a couple years ago um, of the documentary, and I interviewed a bunch of the real people from Gander, Newfoundland, And then I think a year and a half ago, my sister and I went to the opera house in Boston and we took my mom and we went and saw the musical. And it's a lot in the the style of like a Hamilton where you've got people playing multiple roles and it's all happening without the curtains closing and opening. So they have to make do with very minimalistic sets and costume changes. Yeah. It's one of the best musicals and stage performances I've ever seen. 
Interesting. I think you would really love it. And it's it gives you a little bit of faith in humanity. And so now a lot of my 9-11 mindset, I, I'm forced to think about the good that was happening simultaneously while we were all in the studio scrambling and whatever. Yeah. I, I think you would love it. Hmm. But it's hard to think about that day, which is one of the most altering days for me because it inspired my trips overseas and all of those other things and that yep. I spent it in a room with you and Greg and LB and Rocco and um Maddie yeah George Osborne was there or he was the one who uh, we handed the story to who kind of reported the news but finding out what was going on was like how many websites would you have to go to back then to even find the yeah. information or phone calls or or, or things like that yeah. yeah. Now they don't just... even need us. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> now they just get it themselves on their little phones. I know. Well, I mean, can you imagine if we all had access to Twitter and you know Reddit and all of that, the way oh, that yeah. we did? I mean, we kind of got a glimpse of it with the marathon bombing and how it had changed from 2001 to 2013. But still, I, I just look back at that as being one of those days. And my time at WAF is like top five most memorable experiences because it forced all of us as it did the world out of our comfort zone yeah and being on that side of it as opposed to like you said sitting at home um not knowing what was going to happen next and waiting to hear it from us we're the ones who were waiting to hear it from someone else so we could tell everyone yeah yeah which i think was the hardest thing when coronavirus hit right because we were in a position where we were the essential employee that was constantly forced to go to the radio station, no matter what was happening. Right. Like we weren't allowed to not come to work because it was snowing and we right. weren't allowed to not come to work for whatever oh, reason. The worst. We just, just get to work. <laughs> and that's, that was one of the hardest things once the station went off the air and I was just home that when the coronavirus hit, I talked to Mike Shue about it. Cause he was on the podcast too, of like getting out of the habit of show prepping and yeah. trying to be that useful person because you didn't have that job anymore. It's really hard to get out of that mindset. Yeah. And a big, big chunk of our time, because none of us live close to the station, was just getting there and back. Yeah. The <laughs> amount of time we spent in the car. Yeah. Which I haven't done. And my car, I think, feels like I hate it now because I'm barely ever in it anymore. I'm actually able to wash my car regularly. <laughs> it's, it's, it's wild. It's weird. I have the time. I know. <laughs> it's very strange. Uh. Well, I'm so glad that you came on. It was so nice to be able to catch up. I bumped into you, I don't know, what, a month ago at the mall before it, like we both had masks on. And and I recognized you and you. And I was like, I, I saw your mask because it was a Lost, like oh, the yeah. TV show Lost. And yeah. I was like, that's got to be Kevin. Because <laughs> you're one of the only people that loves that show more than me. I loved that show. Oh, yeah. And I saw it, I was like, oh my God, that's Kevin. Even though I couldn't see your face, I could see your hair and I could just see the, was it the Dharma <laughs> initiative or whatever yep. was on your mask? Yep. Still have the same hair, so. Me too. It was easy to Some recognize. things never change. Yep. We spot each other's hair. We knew it right away. Yeah. Oh, there they are. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm glad that, that at least the technology and things have kind of moved in a way that now... You know, whether it be Mike Shu or, you know, you and I, I actually was able, you would put LB and I kind of back in contact. I hadn't talked to him and since the station went off the air and he texted me 20 minutes after I saw you at the mall and he was like, Excellent. hey, sweets, Kevin told me you were looking for me. And I was like, yeah, dude, I've texted you like 50 times since the station got sold and I haven't heard anything back from you. And he's like, Oh, I'm doing good kid. I'm having another surgery. And I was like, will you come on the podcast? And he's like, when I'm feeling better, I'll come on the podcast. But he sounded oh, really good. So great. I'd yeah, love to I, do that show with him. Let oh, me know when yeah. that is. Yeah. Yeah. Anytime. Hopefully, hopefully I'll be able to get you guys actually in my studio, which would be amazing. Cause I don't know. I mean, you know, always know how, technologically challenged LB was. I don't know if we could get him on this newfangled technology. Maybe you'll have to ask Wilster to hook it up for him. Yeah, he I th he might have an iPhone, so he might be able to do something yeah. simple like that. He's, I don't he's know, doing we'll good. see. Yeah. We'll see. Well, I appreciate <laughs> you taking so much time. Congratulations on the baby. And yes, Adeline Rose. She just turns, she'll be, actually, she'll be seven months on September 11th. How about that? That's crazy. Yeah. 
She's All so, Corona. She's so <laughs> cute. I know. Thank there's going to be this huge, massive baby boom starting in a couple of months with all these Corona babies. Mm -hmm. This is my daughter, Covidia. <laughs> <laughs> and this is my other daughter, Maskey. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what else you could call him. I don't know. Uh, COVID-19. <laughs> She's. This is COVID-19 and this is COVID-18. <laughs> <laughs> Corona. Well, this is Corona. Yeah. How yeah. many people that is that going to be their middle name or it's, you know, how many people are going to get named after Dr. Fauci or Dr. Burks or some of the people that have become famous because of this whole thing, right? <laughs> Fauci, sanitizer, come in the house. <laughs> I actually have a Dr. Fauci bobblehead doll here at MCHQ that somebody sent me. It's great. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> so amazing. Well, I'm so glad that I got to see you and thank you so much for coming on the podcast. If people want to find you online and yes. uh, be able to track you down, do you want to put in plugs for all your... Yeah. Um, I have a Facebook page, uh, facebook.com, uh, Kevin Barbary Official, I think. I had to do a different page for my family page because, you know, they... For some reason, they still limit how many people can be your friend. Oh, yeah. So they have like a work there, page. Yeah. Yes. Kevin Barbary official is the name of the page on Facebook. And then uh, my email is just thekevinbarbary at gmail.com. Everything I'll, else is on my page, like the links and all that stuff. I'll put the links up in the description of the podcast, too. And yeah. um, so people can track you down. And obviously, once things start opening up and you start putting on all those conventions with the vinyl and horror stuff, people will be able to track you down that way. Yeah, there's definitely one at the DCU Center um, next October. Uh, other than that, the other shows, I don't know when or where or what they will be yet because we have to wait until we know what we can do. So, yeah. Can I get you to come in the war room with us? Yeah. Okay, because I, I definitely think that people listening to this are going to want to be able to ask questions and get you to do impressions oh, and all of that stuff. Yeah, so you'll have to get whatever your favorite cocktail is and... I'll get you to come in for an after action report in the war room. That would be awesome. That sounds good. Yeah. All right, All right Kevin. <laughs> it was so great to see you. You too. Congratulations on your wedding. Thank you. I know. I'm a <laughs> missus. It's so oh, weird. Is that, was that supposed to be not like, are you not married? No, everybody, everybody knows I'm life? married. Oh, come on. No, everybody knows I'm married. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Look, I got, I got a, a black diamond with skulls on my wedding band wow. and my engagement ring. I mean, come on. He, who, he knows me. He does. He knows Very me. Very nice. All right. Well, thanks for having me on. I'm around anytime. There he is, the one and only Kevin Barbary. It was so awesome to have him on the podcast. Huge thanks to Kevin, and all of his social media uh, pages are linked in the description of this podcast, so you can keep up on what Kevin's got going on. Thanks once again to Jumptown Skydiving at jumptown.com and Latini Creative Solutions at latinicreative.com for sponsoring this week's episode. And you got to see that movie Oscar that we were talking about. It's awesome. If you liked what you heard, make sure you leave a comment on the podcast and uh, give it a five-star review. And if you got friends that are old school WAF fans, definitely share this episode with them and let them know that it's out there. And click subscribe so you don't miss an episode of the Mistress Carrie podcast. Also linked in the description of this episode is the custom playlist. I do a different playlist of music for every episode. And all the links to all of my social media pages are up there. And once again, thanks to everyone that has gotten the Mistress Carrie backstage pass on Patreon. And don't forget to join me live every Tuesday night at 8.30 Boston time on my Facebook page, facebook.com slash Mistress Carrie WAF for cocktails in the war room. To celebrate joining Pantheon Podcasts, Rock Camp, the podcast, the official podcast of Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp, is giving away a guitar signed by Mike Portnoy of Dream Theater, Marty Friedman, formerly of Megadeth, and legendary shredder Zach Wilde, plus our rock star counselors like Vinny Apice, Monty Pittman, and more. To enter to win, simply follow, rate, and review our podcast on your preferred platform, and that's all you have to do. For more information, go to rockcamp.com forward slash podcast.